If there is one thing that most low elo ADC players don't criticize themselves enough for, it is their team fighting. As a marksman, it's so easy to shrug things off to either, hey, my team didn't peel for me, or the enemy team's champs are too broken, ADC in current year, etc. The truth of the matter is though that if most low elo ADCs were actually good at team fighting, that they would climb instantly. It's literally what the role is built for, so if you're not succeeding in low elo team fights, then you're obviously doing things disastrously wrong. In this guide, we're going to put you up to the test. We'll show you a bunch of examples of team fighting ADCs. If you can accurately tell whether you're watching a good or bad ADC and what they're doing right or wrong, then we'll give you a premium skill capped pass to use the previous excuses in your game. It doesn't get any better than that, so let's jump right into things. In this first game, we have a very fed Kaisa looking to carry the game, and the following skirmish that occurs is pretty ideal for that to come true. Kane tries to pick off Kaisa, but due to her mobility, she easily turns things around and kills him nearly instantly. Afterwards, Kaisa, Yumi, and Yone look to push into the enemy base. Watch what happens and see if you can accurately assess whether this is a good or bad ADC and what you may or may not have done differently in this situation. So you should have very clearly been able to identify that this was a low elo example. Let's break down why and let us know whether you were able to identify all the things that Kaisa did wrong as you watched. For starters, although this isn't a macro guide, the fact that Kaisa went toward mid lane where the inhibitor was already down instead of going to take a free Baron should have instantly been a low elo giveaway. As for her skirmishing, her first mistake was before she even got off her first auto attack. While pushing, Kaisa notices Sion coming into his base. Normally, when someone randomly appears behind you, you should definitely be hesitant about being flanked by multiple people. But for starters, Kaisa already knew where most of the enemy team was. Kane was dead, meanwhile Corky and Zyra were visible in the base. Although Twitch was still hiding, the main issue here is Kaisa failing to read Sion's body language. As he entered the base, look at this massive drift to the left. We really want to emphasize how important that is. Very rarely will players in League of Legends mind game with their body language during skirmishes and teamfights. The fact that Cyan did that was a clear giveaway that he was alone and not a threat at all. And yet, it took Kaisa about 3 seconds to finally realize how vulnerable he was. If she wasn't nearly as fed as she was, that DPS loss could have caused big issues later on. Right after that, when she turns to Zyra, she makes another big mistake. Look, it's good to know combos and how to use them, but players tend to get too eager to be fancy for no reason. If you noticed at the moment Kaisa flashed, Zyra wasn't even in an animation to cast any spell. It's not like Kaisa is trying to dodge her root or anything with the flash. Not only that, but she could have easily caught up with her E if she just waited 2 seconds. The only purpose in this flash was to look cool or something, I guess. Then she's not punished for her mistake at all because for some reason this Twitch thinks he's a melee champion. Correct us if we're wrong, but Twitch has the highest auto attack range in the game with his ultimate up. If he had just played remotely properly, Kaisa dies instantly because she would have no way to close the distance between them. And finally, her death to Corky. She could have maybe won this if she kited up instead of down and back into the package. She did have plenty of time to see Corky's package angle and react appropriately. But there's no way to expect that from a lower elo player, so this was an understandable error. We really want to emphasize that, although you may be hard carrying your games and winning fights, that it doesn't mean you're doing everything perfectly. If you put an actually good ADC into a room and had him go through a million replays of challenger and gold elo ADCs, they'd be able to accurately assess whether they're good or bad 99% of the time regardless of what their in-game scores are. Alright, let's move on to our next example. Again, see if you can tell whether this is a good or bad ADC. Before getting into what actually happens, take a moment to look at the compositions and see how strong everyone is. Alright, so at the start of it all, Jinx and her team are pushing mid. It's at this time that they notice the enemy threatening to do Baron. As they approach the fight, 
Jinx splits off from her team and does a massive loop around the red buff wall. Eventually, she's able to join up with her crew and they manage to kill Jax. Things get dicey for a second there as Lee Sin almost takes down Jinx, but overall things went well for the blue team. All right, so based on what you saw, do you think this was a good high elo ADC or a bad low elo one? All right, this one may have been a bit trickier than the last one, but it should have been clear that this is a fairly decent player. In fact, it's T1's Gumiyusi, you know, decent. Let's break down the simple fundamentals that he followed in this fight. We showed you everyone's items because we wanted you to be aware of the lethality Lee Sin on the enemy team. That build is basically the same as if you're playing against a one-shot assassin. The problem that he faced in this fight is that he and his team were running blindly into the enemy team's vision. When you're walking into fog, that is when assassins are generally at their strongest because it allows them to set up onto you with an ideal combo. For example, a LeBlanc in full vision in a mid fight has to maybe W then flash RQE to reach a high priority target. This isn't her ideal damage rotation and it still has a chance of being interrupted by the enemy team. Whereas a LeBlanc hiding in a bush can look for the perfect EQRW combo, which maximizes her damage with zero counterplay in return. This is precisely why Gumiyusi took the long way around. His team may not have had Baron Vision, but they did have random wards in the enemy jungle. Trying to fight on your own vision is a simple fundamental when it comes to skirmishing and team fighting. Yes, he is losing out on damage by doing this, but he knows Lee is near Baron, and this way he's completely safe for the moment. And what we just discussed is precisely what happened as well. Lee not having clean access to Jinx has to perform a mediocre combo. Instead of maximizing the execute damage from his Q, he's forced to use it as a gap closer to try and get on top of Jinx. This results in him barely not having enough damage to finish Jinx off, and the fight is completely lost for the red team. And not playing around vision or where your opponents may potentially be is something we see a lot of low elo ADCs fail at constantly. Here's a nearly platinum level Jin failing miserably at this task. As he's approaching mid, he very clearly sees the enemy fiddlesticks in front of him who goes into the bottom side of the river. With that knowledge, five seconds later, he goes aggressively onto Azrael and even begins channeling his ultimate in perfect range to get fiddle ulted from this brush. Thankfully, this Jin rightfully gets punished, even if it wasn't by Fiddle. Fighting around your own vision and being aware of where your opponents are may not be the most exciting concept when it comes to team fighting, but it's definitely one of the first things most top ADCs focus on, as you just saw from the previous example. All right, let's move on to another example. For this one, we'll go ahead and tell you that it's a good ADC, Gen G's Ruler. Let's do something different this time. We'll let you watch the team fight first. As it's playing, we'll give you hints for when you should be paying attention to something Ruler is actively doing. See if you can accurately assess everything that he was trying to do as it happens. And afterwards, we'll break everything down. Good luck. Okay, just because Ruler and his team ended up losing the fight doesn't mean that he didn't follow a ton of fundamentals appropriately. Let's see how many you were able to pick up as you watched the fight. The first one was a bit tricky, but it's a very important team fighting concept. Whenever you're engaging with the enemy team, you should always be asking yourself, should I even be here at the moment, and could I instead be doing something better? What happened here is that Ruler and his team had already established vision control in this area of the river. The enemy team seemed to be walking away, which meant that Ruler had an opportunity to instead pressure the incoming wave. That way they'd both have control of the river and mid at the same time. 
getting mid prio is something we talk about a lot in our videos. It's not so much that getting a single wave into your opponent's tower is insane, but it's good in that it gives you more options for what you can do. For example, if the enemy team is over committing to the dragon and it's being stalled out, you could rotate over to mid with the wave and take their inhibitor tower for free. That was his intention in the fight, but the second the enemy team randomly decided to try and come back this way, Ruler turned around and joined his team to drive them away from this choke point. The second big moment that you should have paid attention to is right afterwards. If the enemy team can't go through this choke point, then they'll obviously come in through the only other entrance to the river. While it is Caitlyn specific to trap that other entrance, the important point here is understanding your opponent's options. Keeping track of where from and how the enemy team will approach the fight is pivotal for any ADC. Repositioning based on that information can oftentimes be the deciding factor in whether you win or lose an encounter. Sadly, what happens next is the reality of solo queue. Just like you, Ruler has to deal with incompetent players. Due to his traps, he and Echo wanted to burst the dragon while the enemy team is forced to awkwardly enter the river. Again, he may be on Caitlyn, but this is the equivalent of abusing a tempo advantage on any other ADC to quickly secure an objective. Unfortunately, his LeBlanc and Lux were completely clueless as to what was going on. This meant that the enemy team had a much easier time of getting in to contest the dragon. There's nothing Ruler could have done about that, but he did try his best to make up for their mistakes. When faced with danger, a lot of bad ADC players tend to run away in fear. But Ruler puts on his big boy pants and does what any good ADC would. Instead of leaving Echo to fend for himself, he positions very aggressively to zone the talent. All the while, he's making sure to try and dodge as many Jin ults as he can. As an ADC, he couldn't do much more than force Talon to have to use his ultimate to get into the pit, but that is definitely more than most other ADCs would have forced here, which would have been useful if his Echo pressed his ult. And that's the tragedy that ends up losing the blue team this fight. Toward the end, we see one last ditch effort from Ruler to clutch things out. Pat yourself on the back if you got this one, he was trying to play around Fog of War to surprise the Jin. With the pink ward in the brush and Gragas not actually going into it, Ruler knew that the enemy team had no vision of him here. He also spotted Jin walking around this way a couple of seconds ago. Since Jin was running Predator, which is the meta at the time, Ruler knew that his only choice here was to maybe cheese him with a blind trap. It almost worked, but sadly it was not meant to be and he does go down. So it should be clear from all of these examples just how much high level ADCs are thinking about in fights compared to lower level players. They're making so many subtle movements and choices all the time to increase their chances of winning as much as possible. Yes, of course, sometimes things still don't go their way, but you can say the same thing about lower elo ADCs. They sometimes do everything wrong and are still rewarded for it anyway. All right, remember that team fighting is about proper fundamentals and sticking to them as we just saw. Practice those and you'll be carrying in no time. So you might be asking yourself why go to skillcap.com to improve when I could just watch YouTube guides or play the game. Well, let me show you. Let's say you're an 80 carry who's struggling to climb the ladder. Not only would you get over 55 site exclusive courses for 80 carry, but maybe really what you've been struggling with is wave control in bot lane. Well, we got you covered with six different courses breaking down wave control as an 80 carry. Not only do we have the largest catalog of guides for League of Legends in the entire world with over 1500 videos to watch, but these are then curated by the top coaches and players into courses on every skill and topic you need to master in order to truly improve and climb the ladder. If all of this wasn't enough, we haven't even touched on our catalog of over 700 smurf commentaries, where a challenger expert shows you how to climb out of your rank and you're guaranteed to get any questions answered by them directly. Not to mention, we're the only service to offer a rank improvement guarantee. If you don't climb at least five divisions while actively using Skillcap, you can claim a refund, no questions asked. So what are you waiting for? Head to skillcap.com and get the rank you've always wanted. Link in the description below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.